the end of this uh, chapter, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I started to say Brother Paul. Hey, the Bible calls him Brother Paul, so we can call him Brother Paul. Uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he ends with this famous verse, or famous section, I guess, on the armor of God and the spiritual warfare. And uh, it's a great passage, particularly there, verse 12 is what I want to look at tonight. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And, of course, it goes on about the armor of God, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But surely in this world we have physical principalities. You know, principalities, you think of the word prince. You know, that's what principality is. It has to do with the, a place that is ruled or, or led by a prince. And so the same kind of idea there, the principal person that's in charge there. Uh, principalities, we have those in our world. We have, um, you know, rulers, powers, you could say, the powers that be. Uh, we've got a lot of forces in this world that lead us. In, and, uh, you know, certainly you could look at a warfare there, or you could even take this, this verse and apply that to the warfare that we're up against, like these people trying to stop us from doing things or whatever. But this isn't what it's talking about because it, it specifically says in this passage that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we're not talking about flesh and blood principalities, not flesh and blood rulers and, and all that are out there. Now, obviously, Satan can use those. The, the, the devils can influence and guide those rulers. We'll talk about that here a little bit as well. But... Um, but what we want to talk about are particularly the spiritual world. Okay, what does it mean? The rulers of the darkness of this world. And that's what we're going to uh, try to break down tonight. Now, every time I set out to preach on spiritual, the spiritual world, you know, particular demons or demon possession or anything, I always have in my mind when I set out to study these things what I want to come up with. I mean, these are the things that I want to be able to preach and I want to be able to, you know, just go through the Bible and show you all the time somebody was possessed by a demon or there's demon oppression or all that. And I get asked this question a lot. And recently somebody specifically asked me about some things that were going on. What did I think? Could that be the be uh, demonic forces at work? And I don't know. Could be. You know, and I said, oh, let me study this subject out a little bit. And I've done this before. I've done some Sunday school lessons where I get a little bit deep, more detailed into it. But what I always come to the conclusion is we just don't know. There's so much about the spiritual world that we don't understand, whether it's demonic forces or, you know, godly angels, messengers, you know, angels and uh, uh, unaware. I mean, there's so many, so many things that we could look at in the Bible when it comes to the spiritual world and say, I just, we just don't understand it. So, uh, so, you know, the message isn't going to be as detailed as far as those kinds of things go as I would like them to, but I just, I just came back to this idea that we know we got to look at this, what we can process from the scripture here, what we can know and what we can take away from this concept of the spiritual powers at work, okay? The rulers of the darkness of this world. So the first point that I want to make about the, the rulers of the darkness of this world, sp the, these spiritual rulers are not something that we can see. Okay, the spiritual rulers, talking about these powers, are not something that we can see. Now, of course, they can have an impact on the physical world that we see. We understand that. They can, uh, you know, somehow affect that. And maybe there's times, I'll point out some exceptions here in a minute, times where you could see somebody who is acting on behalf of Satan. You know, um, I think about, uh, you know, uh, Judas you know, who Satan just came over him and he went and did what he was supposed to do. Uh, you know, there's times where, you know, we see this, uh, you know, but typically we don't actually see the uh, spiritual world. Uh, you know, I think about even as far as angels go, like, I mean, the good, you know, you know, people use the word guardian angel or whatever, but, you know, we, I believe there are forces all around that we can't see. And, uh, you know, I think about the passage where Elisha, and his servant are there and the enemy's coming after them and Elisha looks at his servant and says, oh, don't worry, there, there's more, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he says, there's more for, on our side than there are on their side. 
And he looks around, he's got this great army that's coming, and it's just Elisha and his servant. And he's like, how can you say that there's more with us than are on their side? And so he prays, Elisha prays and says, open up his eyes so he can see. And he sees all of a sudden the spiritual uh, army that's there, these angels, these fiery uh, images that he sees, and he kind of gets a glimpse into the spiritual world. And so there are times where God has allowed, you know, particularly in the Bible, uh, we see God has allowed people's eyes to be open to spiritual things in that way, spiritual uh, bodies. But for the most part, typically we don't see the spiritual world. Now, a few exceptions in the Bible that you might think about, like I was trying to think in my mind, you know, where were there any cases where Satan himself was seen or a demon was seen or something like that. And, and you know, I kind of thought about some things. Of course, the first time you even hear talk about Satan is in the Garden of Eden, right? So you see Eve is, is just having a conversation with Satan. However, what she's really having a conversation with is an animal. So this is just my, this is my theory on this. I don't know if I can say 100%. I think I have some pretty good, uh, you know, things, like uh, scripture that I can back this up with. But, you know, it appears to me, of course, Satan always being called a dragon. You know, it appears to me like he was some kind of a lizard or dragon type form in the Garden of Eden because then he's cursed and he goes on to his crawl on his belly, right, as part of that, that curse. And I think this was a real, a real animal who Satan had, you know, entered into and here's somehow talking to Eve and, you know, they're brand new to this world and everything. So they don't seem surprised that these animals are talking. And so, uh, uh, and then eventually that animal is cursed, you know, and so that's maybe where the, the serpent or the snake began. Uh, whereas the, whatever happened to the dragon, you know, that was, that was cursed or maybe there were other offspring. I don't know. These are just, these are just, uh, just an educated guess. Uh, uh, okay. But, uh, so my point there, though, is that I don't believe that even in that case, and this is before the, the fall or right at the time of the fall, I don't think Adam and Eve actually could physically see the spiritual you know, side. Uh, I know that they talked with God. The voice of God was in the garden, and so they, they heard his voice. And in this case, they are, they are talking with Satan through this animal, the serpent, uh, but I don't believe necessarily that they saw him in his in his true form. Now, other times in the Bible, we see that there are people again, like Elisha, who who, who they actually saw these angels uh, that were burning, you know, with fire. They they look appeared to be burning. Uh, we see Ezekiel has a picture of of these cherubim in the sky. We see it again in Revelation. We see uh, all throughout the Bible, Isaiah. Uh, these references where they see these images that, and they're they're described, you know, pretty accurately, pretty consistently, th even though they're different authors. Uh, but so there are some glimpses into the spiritual world, but I don't know to what degree they're actually seeing uh, seeing these. And then there's the case of of uh, when Satan tempts Jesus for forty days and forty nights in the wilderness, but we don't really know. First of all, if he's actually seeing him or what the case is. Second of all, it's Jesus. Okay, so it's kind of a different scenario. He has a little bit more, he's a little more in touch with the spiritual world uh, than we are in our human bodies. Of course, he's God and man at the same time. So, uh, so you know, there are some exceptions to this point. But for the most part, this is important to the rest of the message that you understand that we can't see the spiritual world. We are physical. We're limited by what we can see. We don't understand uh, how time works outside of our understanding of it, this time and space that we live in. We don't understand uh, spiritual powers and, and all that, and so we're pretty limited on that. And uh, so uh, this is really important to see. Now, here is what I believe the main point is of calling these guys rulers of the darkness of this world. I guess I never really thought about it too much, but uh, in the past, maybe I would have uh, thought about the outer darkness. You know, you talk about uh, in the Bible, it talks about outer darkness. There shall be weeping, gnashing of teeth. So maybe you could think maybe it's re referring to hell, you know, darkness. And you say, yeah, well, wait a minute, hell, how could hell be dark? Hell's fire. Well, here's the thing. A lot of times in the Bible, when it talks about darkness, it's in association with the fire. So it has to do with like the cloud of smoke 
that's showing. Look real quickly, I'll show you in Deuteronomy 4, 11. This isn't super important to the message, but Deuteronomy 4, verse 11. And ye came near, he's recapping what happened here, and he came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. Okay, so, you know, sometimes when you read in the Bible, you could look up the, the word darkness, I think it's used like, a, it's over a hundred times or something like that. Uh, and every time it's used, you know, not every time, but a lot of times whenever it's used, it has to do with, with, with fire, but then there's like a cloud of smoke. Even in the temple, you know, Moses goes into the tabernacle and there's, and then there's this darkness, but it says uh, that something was on fire and then the darkness has to do with this, this cloud of smoke. So anyway, somebody could read that and say, well, the rulers of the darkness of this world and just jump to the conclusion that darkness has to do with evil and has to do with like hell and hellfire and do- outer darkness and all this kind of stuff. But here's a couple problems with that thinking. Number one, again, we're talking about something spiritual. So, like, we can't really see it. And this is what has always kind of plagued me about the concept of hell. Now, I believe, based on the Bible, that hell's in the center of the earth. I believe it, it has to do with... In Luke, where it talks about Lazarus and the rich man, I believe that he went to hell. I believe there was a flame. I believe when the ground opened up and swallowed uh, Korah and all those folks, they went straight down to the heart of the earth. And uh, and what I believe is that on the way down, their body disintegrated, which is what would happen if you fell into the center of the earth. And then the soul stayed there, I guess. I don't understand because at this point, I don't understand how a soul is affected by heat. I don't understand what's going on there. I, that, that just, it, it, it kind of, you know, it's beyond me. And you say, oh, you're a preacher. You're supposed to know all these things. Hey, I decided a long time ago. I, went, I remember I was talking to Valerie about this on the way up here. When I went to Bible college, I thought, I mean, I knew, I knew that I wasn't that bright. Okay. And after about a year, two years in Bible college, I knew like, I'm even dumber than I thought I was. <laughs> okay. However, I had this feeling like, okay, by the time I graduate Bible college, by the time I get into the ministry, I'm going to know everything. And I have to know all these things. I have to have them all figured out. And so, you know, I open up all these the- theology books and here, you know, let me study about demonology and let me study about Satan and all these spiritual things. And the more you dig into that, the more you realize that the commentaries, they don't know, what, the commentators don't know what they're talking about either. I mean, I mean, they're trying, they're trying to do the best they can. But there are some things that we will not understand in this flesh. We do not understand the spiritual world because we're physical. And so it's hard to explain it. It's hard to interpret the Bible and to know exactly how Satan and the demons, uh, you know, impact our body why God even lets them impact their body. Again, I can preach mess. I can, I can give you some educated guesses on how all this works. But a lot of it we don't know. Here's all we know is that the spiritual world, these spiritual powers are something that we can't see, something that we can only see the effects of it. And, uh, and basically we're kind of blind you know, to actually knowing what's going on in these situations. And I believe that's what it means by darkness. Now, a lot of times in the Bible, I already mentioned how sometimes darkness has to do with the cloud and you can't see because of the the smoke and all that. Uh, Sometimes darkness is literally referring to blindness. You know, if the eyes are single, uh, you know, then there's light. Otherwise, you're in darkness and talks about the blind groping in darkness. And so I think this idea is that the spiritual world is unseen to us. Um, but isn't it interesting, though, in the Bible, how darkness is so often a reference to evil, you know, or evil things are called darkness. And I'm going to read these. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read through this list, uh, a little bit of a long list, but I'm just going to read these verses to you and, and think about these verses in their context. Okay, Acts 26, 18 says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Romans 13, 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. 
Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Colossians 1.13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. 1 Peter 2.9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 John 1, 5, and 6. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. 1 John 2, 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. So you see where the Bible uses darkness a lot in reference to just something evil happening. You're in darkness. You're doing the deeds of, of darkness. Now here's the point I want you to see before we go any further. Okay, So the spiritual world is something that we cannot see. We can only feel the impact of it. Uh, we, we only know that it exists and, uh, and we know that it's dangerous. We know Satan roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We understand that he has minions all around. You know, my personal feeling is that we probably have never come face to face with Satan in our lives. It's just my thinking because I don't believe he's he's omnipresent. And so I don't think he really cares to come to Iola or Kansas City and find Pastor Rocky. And like, <laughs> I think he's got plenty of demons out there that can probably handle his light work. <laughs> you know, you say, well, where is he? I don't know, the White House, <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe in the Middle East somewhere. I mean, maybe, you know, he's, he's all these political leaders. I mean, he's got a job to do. I don't think he cares so much about me. But we often say Satan and what we mean are just some demonic forces. I don't understand it, you know. Uh, now, whenever he was literally impacting Job or, you know, he was literally tempting Judas or, or Peter or something like that, uh, you know, that was different. These are people that were walking with Jesus. You know that he was trying to, you know, he was behind getting the Pharisees to try to tempt Jesus and, and uh, trip up Jesus and all that kind of stuff. We know he was there when they put Jesus on, on the cross. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a whole lot that we can preach about Satan, but basically we just demonic forces in general is what we're looking at. And so here's what I want you to note. All these verses about darkness... What's the opposite of darkness? Kind of like it's kind of a trick. <laughs> is that a trick question or what? Well, it is a kind of a trick question. The opposite of darkness is light, right? But light in the Bible, what we're going to see here in a second, light equals truth. So light's not always about what we see or don't see physically speaking, but also it has to do with truth. If you don't know the truth, you're in darkness. If you're in the truth, you're in light. Let's look at a few verses that talk about that. John chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. I preached on this, uh, on you know soul winning verses in context. We went to John 3, and we looked at, these verses here, and uh, and I believe what he's saying is not, it's not that, you know, men love darkness, they love to do bad things, and so they don't come to Jesus. I don't think it's quite what they're saying here. They can't be saved because they're doing bad, bad things. No, we all, if that's the case, then we're all in darkness because we're all sinners. We've all done bad things, and we all love our sin. He's like, oh, you got to hate sin. I'm like, I, I, in, in many ways, I hate sin, but in many ways, if we're honest with ourselves, we love sin. Otherwise, otherwise we'd stop doing it, <laughs> okay? And so it's natural within us. This body wants to sin, and so we have to deny it. We need to mortify the flesh, and we need to walk in the, in the spirit. But, but when it says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, here's what I, I preached. Here's the point that I made in that message is that I think what's going on is he's saying, look, if, if somebody you know, is going to be truthful and be open and let everybody see the fact that they're, they're sinners, right? That person can be saved. I mean, they don't have to, everyone has to, doesn't have to see every single sin that they did, but the fact that, Hey, you know what? I'm a sinner. I can't get myself into heaven. I need, yeah, I need to accept Jesus's righteousness because I don't have the righteousness to get me to heaven. And that's kind of like an open book. And that's like, 
you know, saying that I love the light. I want the light to, to, to shine on me. Whereas if we love darkness, like we're hiding those sins and we're trying to make people pretend that we're good enough to get ourselves to heaven. So what we're really doing is we love darkness. We like to conceal the sin and hide from the truth. Okay, you say, how do you know that? Well, I mean, some of that is just is my thinking, my reasoning, but let's continue reading and see what it says here. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth, what's the next word? Truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Okay, so he's coming to the truth. The truth is the fact that, hey, my, I can't get to heaven on my righteousness. I can only get to heaven on the righteousness of God, what he provided for me. Okay, that's very important that we think about that for the last point that I'm going to get to. But let's look, uh, let's look at another verse here. Go to uh, chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 31 says, Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm going to preach on that here in uh, next uh, next Sunday in Iola. On the uh, that's a misquoted passage of scripture. A lot of people say the truth shall set you free, but here he's saying the truth will make you free, and it's a really it's a deep thought, and it's really good uh, good thing to study. Okay, he says they they answered him, "We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free?" Jesus answered them, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin." And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Uh, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen of your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me. A man, hath ha a, a, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be, born, we, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love him. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, uh, of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if, uh, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, We um, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye dishonor me. Uh, and I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Where's the verse I was looking for? Okay. Uh, I don't know. There's some good stuff here, but <laughs> I don't know what, what the verses I, I kind of like skipped over it probably. But you see here where he's talking about the truth and he's saying like, you can't believe the truth. You, you, you don't, you, you, you can't see the truth because you don't, uh, you don't believe in me. And so you notice here, it's many times in the Bible when it's referring to, you know, God is light. You can, you can say, you know, what he's, what, what God is, is truth. You know, when he enlightens us to something, he's, he's giving us the truth. Now we see the truth. We have the wisdom and we have the, uh, the understanding. So let me go to uh, point number two here. So if the spiritual rulers are not something that we can see, how do we know that they're at work today? Because point number two is this. The spiritual powers are at work in our world today. Bible makes that clear. Uh, and obviously, you know, we can kind of see that something's not right. God, our Father, is not the one that's allowing some of these bad things to happen in, in, the, in the world. So here's what's going on. 
these the rulers, the physical rulers that we have today, are are obviously some of them are being influenced by Satan. But Satan is going around, and his job is what he wants to do is he wants to keep people from knowing the truth. He wants to keep people in darkness, and he wants to keep them away from the light. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11. Now again, here's a verse that you could read and think, well, see, you know, you can see Satan because Satan appears uh, according to this context. Well, here's what it says, 2 Corinthians 11, starting verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Okay, and so the basic idea, I believe what he's saying is simply this, like Satan will show himself like he's preaching truth. You know, he'll, he'll come as though he's your friend. He'll come as though he's offering you something that's good for you. Does that ring a bell, the Garden of Eden? You know, he comes to Eve and he's like, he's like, no, 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 God didn't say that. You know, God, th this is going to be good for you. It's going to open your eyes and you're going to be wise. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's, he's transforming himself to a minister of, of light. And so we shouldn't be surprised when there are people who pretend to be good and there are people who pretend to be righteous and maybe spiritual leaders, maybe even pastors and preachers, uh, missionaries and all. And actually what they're doing, I mean, I'm not telling you to go around looking at all these guys as being bad, but what they are doing, we shouldn't be surprised if we find out that some of these guys are actually doing the work of Satan. You know, obviously if they're preaching false gospel, a lot of people in the name of Christ are going about preaching false gospel. Those guys aren't doing the work of God. They're doing the, way, they're doing the work of Satan. People that are uh, uh, greedy, a filthy lucre, and people in the ministry that are just trying to do everything they can to, to build an empire and get you know, lots of money coming in, and, and they look at it as a job. You know, I was just talking to somebody about, I'm going to go out to, uh, to Sullivan on the 29th, and, and they've been looking for a pastor for a long time. And that's got to be a terrible situation because the way that, the, the typical way that a church looks for a pastor is basically they just go through resumes and they put the word out there that they're looking for a pastor and then you got all these these people who want to be pastors maybe they got fired from a pastor at somewhere else or maybe they got out of bible college and they're looking for a place to go pastor and it becomes like this job they're sending their resumes they're trying to make themselves look good and then they come and they said a lot of times people come and they're looking around and it's kind of like eh, i don't see a lot of uh, this is maybe reading between the lines, but I don't see a lot of potential for growth and, and how are they ever going to support me and how can I ever, you know, really get successful at this work? Because they're thinking money, they're thinking prosperity. And not, not, these aren't all wicked like lost people, you know, but I guarantee you that Satan has dangled that in front of their eyes. And I know this from even going to Bible college, which I don't believe that the motives were wrong by the professors and everything, but the, the, the temptation coming out of Bible college, the temptation is that, hey, in order to be profitable, I mean, to uh, successful, prosperous is the word I'm looking for. In order to be prosperous, you know, you've got to have a church that looks like this and you've got to have it growing and you've got to have a bus ministry and you've got to have all this kind of stuff. You've got to have people that are tithing and then on top of their tithes are giving offerings. And on top of their offerings, they're giving, you know, faith promise missions. And I mean, this is just a healthy church that's giving you all the money. And I'm not saying, again, that every guy that is in a church that does faith promise or something like that is wicked. I'm just saying that you can see, don't be surprised that Satan's behind some of these tactics and Satan's behind some of the things that go on in selling stuff and trying to make a profit off of the people. Uh, that's This could be bad. Obviously false, uh, like I said, false gospel, uh, this health and, I mean, we don't even, I'm, I'm talking about people more, more like us, but let alone the health and uh, prosperity gospel and, you know, wealth and prosperity gospel, health too, I guess, that God, if you're, if you're living for him and you're serving him, then he's going to give you health and he's going to give you lots of money and all this kind of stuff. That's not in the Bible. That's not how it works. And so uh, a lot of these guys are just being, uh, they're deceiving people 
uh, under the influence of Satan. How does he influence them? I don't know. Are these guys demon possessed? Maybe some of them are. Some of them might be saved people who are just, you know, getting caught up in the lies and the deception that Satan uses. And so Satan is keeping people in spiritual blindness and in, and, and he's keeping them blind from the truths of God's word. And, uh, and we have to realize that this is the battle that we're in. It's, a, it's the battle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this world. Okay, and so people, man, you know, we know that the Antichrist is going to come, right? We call him the Antichrist, uh, the beast is what he's called in Revelation. Uh, I think we get all, I think all the times that Antichrist, actual word Antichrist is used is in 1 John, 2 John. And uh, it talks about the spirit of Antichrist. It says that there are many Antichrists. And so, you know, you don't actually see capital A, the Antichrist, which is what we usually call him. But we understand that there will be a, a person who is the epitome of the Antichrist spirit, right? And he is going to be uh, the, 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 this beast that Satan gives power to. And he's got a false prophet as well that's going out and preaching his gospel. And we know that this is going to come and there's going to be many people who are on his side and they're deceiving people with miracles and they're deceiving people with deception. And uh, obviously this, this one world government, one world religion, all this kind of stuff comes from all of this. Who's that by? That's from the influence of Satan. That's from the powers of this world. And so, you know, a lot of times you start talking about that and people think like, oh, here are some conspiracy theories and they believe in the Illuminati and, and the, the triangles with the eye in it. I don't know what that's called. <laughs> and, the, and so it's all about the Illuminati. Well, look, what, whatever your conspiracy theories are in regards to the governing powers that be and the leaders of the banks and the, the Rothschild or whatever, you know, whatever, I, I, fine. I don't have a problem with any of those views. But here's what I know, that it's not the... It's not the physical people that we're at battle against. It's the Satan and the demonic influences that are using those people. You know, you say, man, you sure have a hard time sometimes with uh, the rich people in this world and the political leaders and the, and the scientists so-called of this world, you know, uh, the med even the medical field. I'm, I preach against it and I, and I have a lot of struggles with that sometimes. And it's not those people. You know, I don't even know anything about Anthony Fauci. <laughs> Okay, I don't know anything about him. If I don't trust him or if I think, hey, there's something, there's some agenda that's going on in this world or whatever, it's not that human being, all right? It's the fact that people are deceived by Satan and Satan's got an agenda and Satan's deceiving people. And so I naturally am skeptical. How do we keep grounded on that? Well, if Satan wants to keep us in the dark, if he wants to blind our eyes from the truth, how, you know, what's, what's the answer? And so... Uh, that brings me to the last point. I feel like I missed some things here, but that's right. Uh, that brings me to the last point, which is this. The spiritual rulers are subject to God, okay? Spiritual rulers, I'm talking about those dark uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, they're subject to God. Satan can't even do anything without God's permission, right? Satan, when he... Uh, physically brought about, now this is an interesting thing, okay, uh, speaking of Fauci, <laughs> all right, Satan, uh, Satan physically, did he not touch Job with an affirmity and give him boils? You know, I don't understand. I don't understand how he has that power other than the fact that he had to get permission from God to do it, am I right? So, you know, could pestilence, worldwide pestilence be something uh, that is brought on by Satan, but he had to get permission from God to do it? Absolutely, absolutely. And could he use that situation to bring a, about a one world government? Absolutely. You know, could he cause people, now listen to this, could he cause people to be so scared of this pandemic that they stop going to church and they stop uh, assembling together? Absolutely. Every day we go knocking on doors, how many times? I mean, isn't it almost every time you knock on the door and someone says, well, I haven't actually gone. To, you know, do you go to church anywhere? Well, not since the, not since COVID. And I'm like, so for two years, you've been <laughs> sitting at home. You haven't gone to church one time. That can't be, that can't be helpful for your spiritual growth. Not only that, the Bible says what? So much the more as you see the day approaching. So much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, how are you to see the day approaching? Well, the Bible says wars pestilence, you know, he says all these things. So we know the day is approaching. You say, well, I don't think this is it. Well, maybe it's not. 
But if if this is if this isn't it, and we can't continue assembling during this, well, what's it going to be like? You know, whenever uh, whenever it really is it, and so. Uh, you know, can Satan use pestilence and, you know, worldwide mandates and government mandates and, and all that? Absolutely. Absolutely he can. And so, but here's the thing. He's subject to God. So my, so the spiritual warfare is one that we have to fight against who, who are physical, by the way. You say, yeah, well, we have a spirit, of course, but we are limited in many ways, by this by this physical body until we until we get our glorified body and go to heaven, okay. And so, our we're subject to this, but we're in a battle against a spiritual warfare that we can't see, but God can see it. And these guys can't do anything without God's approval. So how do we fight the spiritual warfare? Seems pretty evident, doesn't it? God's got to fight it for us. <laughs> we can't we can't fight an enemy that we can't see and who's doing things that we don't understand and is out about deceiving people, you know, our own brothers and sisters in Christ even being deceived. The Bible says there's going to be a great falling away. I believe we're in the falling away, but I don't know exactly what that's going to you know, what what that's going to look like as we get closer and closer to the last days. But I think the falling away is not just people turning on each other. The Bible says that's going to happen, and we do see that happening. But people are going to stop assembling, stop going to church. They're going to, you know, grow cold. All, all these kinds of things are going to happen. I believe uh, that we are seeing that. Again, I'm not trying to say, like, here it is, man. We're, we're in the tribulation. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the same battle that we know is going to accumulate to the point of, you know, revelate, what we see in the book of Revelation, you know, that God of this world, little g, God of this world, has been in power for, you know, as long as this, as long as man's been on this earth, almost, and so, uh, and so, the only way to fight that battle is to fight it through God. Look at Second Corinthians nine. Second Corinthians nine. So I guess the truth is, when someone says, "Man, do I, how do I know?" Like. You know, there's this preacher, and he's. It seems like he's deceiving people. Like, is it is it Satan working through that guy? I don't know. Maybe. You know, I'm I'm real depressed lately. You think it could be Satan depressing me? I don't know. Maybe. I'm afflicted. I'm sick. Do you think Satan has touched me and given me this infirmity? I don't know. Maybe. All right. Here's what he says in uh, 2 Corinthians nine, verse three. Yet have I sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf that I said. Uh, no, this isn't it. Oh, man. Okay, chapter 10, I'm sorry. Chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh. All right. If you've been listening at all, this is summarizing everything I just said. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now go back to our text in the Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now he's going to give us the, the articles of clothing, the, the armor that we're supposed to, to uh, put on as we prepare for this battle. Now look, you can't put it on in your own strength. You can't build up your armor. You can't make your armor. It's got to be God's armor. You know, so all these things are, are spiritual things. Remember, it's a battle that we can't even fight in, really. All we can do is submit ourselves to the Lord and let Him do the fighting. So it says, what's the first thing it says? Your loins girt with truth. Okay, so here's the thing. You say, well, I don't know. How do I know I'm not going to be deceived? You know, there's so much so much influence out there. There's so much people saying this and saying that. How do I know what to believe? 
Well, you've got to be grounded in the truth. You've got to gird yourself up with the the belt, if you will, the girdle of truth and cinch that thing up and say, hey, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's going to try to persuade me to believe something different, you know, but I, I, I'm going to be grounded in the truth because I want to be, I want to know the truth. I want to know that there are people out there trying to deceive me and I want to get to the truth of God's word. Okay, the uh, breastplate of righteousness, you know, just do what you know to be right regardless of the battles that come in your ways or the sicknesses or the deception or, or the persecution or whatever it might be, you just keep doing, doing right. I love, I just recently preached on great quotes from the Bible and, and Job is one of my favorite where he says, though, uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And then it says, uh, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but he says, I will be true to to my way. I can't remember how that's, that's a misquote, but, uh, but he's basically saying, I'm going to stay on the path that I know to be right based on God's word. And I'm just going to, uh, just put my trust that God is going to bless me for that in the end. And that's what we need to do. Keep walking in righteousness. we got that breastplate of righteousness that'll keep us from the, the, the wiles of the devil and the fiery darts of the devil. Number three, the feet shod with the press preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, I can't help, obviously, all throughout the Bible, you know, uh, uh, blessed, are the feet that, uh, the blessed are the feet of him that brings good tidings, you know. And, and all through the Bible, we see this reference uh, that, you know, I can't think, I can't interpret any other way than soul winning. You know, what do, what do we do as Christians? How do we keep doing the spiritual warfare that God's called us to do? Well, we, we gird ourselves with the truth. You know, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. We just do what we know to be right. One of the things we know to be right based on the Bible is we go preach the gospel, <laughs> you know, to the lost. And we go spread we go uh, spread the gospel of peace. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith. Okay, we're doing it all in faith because we can't see. We can't see the, spirit, the, the spiritual warfare that's going on. I mean, we might be, see the effects here and there. We might know in our hearts, you know, the conscience, the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. We might know that we're doing right, uh, but we can't really see it. We're just walking by faith, searching after the truth, trying to live righteous. Got our helmet of salvation. Don't let anyone ever, you know, talk you into doubting your salvation. You know that you're safe in the Lord and he's going to guide and direct you. Finally, you have your sword of the spirit. Uh, you need to be in your word, be in the word, be in your Bible, uh, reading it, trying to commit it to memory, preaching it to other people and uh, and preach the word. It talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is how we fight the the uh, spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that we can't see. You say, well, I want to know more about demon possession and how to cast out demons and I don't know. Maybe you want to know about holy water. It doesn't exist, okay? <laughs> you know, crucifixes and stuff like that. That's that's just fairy tales, okay? Here's how you fight a spiritual battle. You gotta you gotta trust in God. You gotta have faith in Him. And you gotta hold to the truth and let Him guide and direct. Because otherwise, you're just a sitting. You're just an open target. You know, if you don't if you're if you don't have the armor of God on. You're just free game for the devil, for the powers of the darkness of this world to just steer you ever, whichever way and wrestle you and, uh, and, and shoot you with fiery darts. So we need to walk in the Lord uh, and according to His righteousness. The spiritual rulers are not something we can see. Spiritual rulers, however, are it at work in our world today. But the spiritual rulers are subject to God. And so we need to just leave the battle for him and stay true to, uh, to God and his word. Father, we thank you for giving us the truth. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And we know we make mistakes. We know we're limited by the flesh. But I pray, Lord, you help us walk in the spirit so that we can uh, remain steadfast and unmovable and we can uh, uh, fight this, this uh, spiritual battle through your strength. And it's not really us hard, uh, really doing the fighting other than just uh, making sure that we're armed with what you've given us to arm ourselves. And Father, we trust you. We pray that you will work things according to your will in our life as we seek to follow it. I pray that you'll bless this church and every individual here uh, as we endeavor to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.